Hi, my name is Becky Walsh and I've got the opportunity to share with you today about activating social justice. So far in the month of August, we've learned about how we can activate faith under pressure, patience, holiness, godly wisdom, mercy and humility. Now, what I want to share to do today with you about activating social justice, we're going to need all those things we've learned over the last few weeks as building blocks in order to be able to do this because it's not always an easy thing to do. Social justice does give us as Christians an opportunity to practically demonstrate the love of God, to live out in our daily lives, not just when we're at church, the essence of James chapter 2 verses 1 to 9, which says, My brothers and sisters, believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favouritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, if you are doing right, but if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Now this is a warning against prejudice of any kind inside and outside of the church. In today's society, it's really easy to be tainted by um, public opinion, popular opinion, social media, celebrities, media stars, politicians, whoever, friends, family. The thing is, we need to be careful about that. We talked about influencing before, and we need to remember that we should be an influencer and not just be influenced. What we just spoke about in James is just key to what we got to be like. I know some of you are thinking, well, I'm sure we aren't prejudiced in our church. I'm sure I wouldn't be like that. I'm sure I'm not prejudiced. I don't make assumptions about people. I don't discriminate people. I help out, I do my bit. Well, let me ask you all this. As I share with you this morning what God has put in my heart, are we more in love with the idea of changing the world than actually changing the world? Do we like the idea of it? Do we like talking about it? Yeah. Are we actually prepared to do anything about it? Are we prepared to take self-responsibility about it? The scripture in James, put simply, is talking about us not being judgmental, about treating all those that come into our church equally, not showing favouritism because we think certain people can give more or do more. We need to be like that in our lives outside of church as well. We need to treat all those that are in our world, all those that are in our sphere of influence, our community, equally. It's not for us to pass judgment. We need to be looking at what we can do for others, not what they can do for us. In verse 8, it says, If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. Part of that problem, I think, is in today's society... The message gets lost because the way communities are is not the same. We don't even all know who our neighbours are. The world has changed so much, but that doesn't mean we can't still live out that message. For me, neighbours can be seen as community. Where you live, where you work, where your church is based. It's about those you have connections with. It's about those that you interact with, be, it, be on a regular basis or just occasionally or even a one-off. Something I've always tried to live my life by is treating others how I would want to be treated. It doesn't always turn out the best because everyone's got different standards and for me, I'm quite a, an easy going, open, kind, generous kind of person, I think. I like to think so anyway. So 
that's how I expect other people to be towards me and that's not always the case but that's not going to stop me being who I am it's not going to say that I'm going to let people walk all over me and take advantage of me but it means I'm going to carry on treating them with love and with kindness with patience with care so that hopefully the way I treat them rubs off on them something I try to instill into my children is this you cannot control how others treat you but you can control how you treat them and how you respond to situations. I think that's really key. It's hard at times because people do not do treat you differently. But as Christians, we need to remember that we are representing Christ on earth. Just like in the New Testament times, after Jesus has ascended back into heaven, the disciples were left behind to carry on the message, carry his love and spread the good news. And this continued for centuries and it's our turn now. You've got to be the better example. You've got to be the better person. You've got to take the higher road. You've got to be non-judgmental, non-critical. You've got to build people up and put good into their lives. God has, God has always used what society would see and class as marginalised people to fulfil his word. We only have to look in the Bible to see many examples of this. I've just picked a few out. So David, he was the youngest son. His brothers tried to kill him, but God had different plans. He used him to slay a mighty person in the eyes of the people that were living at the time. He used him to further his kingdom and to further his purpose. He was pivotal in the line of Jesus. Moses was born in the time his people, the Israelites, were slaves. Then he was raised in a king's palace, but let his temper get the better of him. Although it was because he saw people being treated badly... So he was kind of, you know, trying to do the just thing and do the right thing by protect his people and stand up for his birthright people, but he didn't do it the right way. So he was in exile, but then God still used him to lead the people out of slavery. Rahab. Her profession in some texts can mean prostitute, or in others, innkeeper. So not an obvious choice of someone that God would use. However, she played a vital role in the Israelites' capture in Jer Jericho by hiding two of the men that had come to spy out the land and helping them escape. These are just three examples of how God uses those who aren't the obvious choice. But for me, when I think about activating social justice, that teaches me two things. God can use me despite my flaws and failings. All that I need to do is respond to God and live out my faith and belief. We need to be looking for the best in people. We need to see past the, what the world sees, see the exterior of who they are and look for the interior. Look for the heart, look for the motive, look for the, the character of the person within. In the New Testament, Jesus continued this way of choosing the not obvious candidates for things. The disciples we know wouldn't have been the most educated men around. They did very practical jobs and yet Jesus chose them to be his closest companions and carry on his work. So how can we activate social justice in us and in our church? As Christians we often will say, well I do my bit. Like I said at the beginning, I help out on church activities, I support the church with my tithe and offerings. Now that's great, we need people to help out with church activities. We need money to provide the activities. We need money to keep the church build, get building going. We need money for the building projects that we're doing so that we can provide more. But that's the whole reason we're doing the building project. We're doing the building project, yes, to make the church bigger so that we can welcome more people in, but actually to provide for the society we live in, to provide for the community we live in, to be able to shelter the homeless, to provide meals for the elderly, to, to do, be able to do lots of other things that I know God's going to talk to us about and going to use that building for. The thing is, what we do inside church isn't enough. We need to do and be church outside of the walls, outside of that building. What I mean by that is that we need to get involved and give our time outside of the church. Outside of the things that just we do because we feel we should, because they're part of our church programme. I'd really encourage you to all to look at how you can volunteer in practical ways. I know it's I know it's tough. I know we've all got time, you know, lack of time mostly. I know we've all got like commitments and we've got stuff that we need to do. We've got families, we've got children, whatever it is. But not all volunteering takes up a massive amount of time. Look at how you can give your time and be involved. So why am I talking about volunteering? How does that relate to social justice? 
The thing is, we believe, we see today that if you're passionate about something, if you believe in something, then you do something about it. We've seen protests march um, for Black Lives Matters, for climate change, for knife crime, for all sorts of things recently, because people believe that if they do something about it, if they show a force, if they do an action, then that will implement change. For us as Christians, to activate the social justice in our life, to reach out to those people that are marginalised in society can be a tough thing to do. We're not really sure where to go, what to do sometimes, so I just want to share with you about my experience of this. I've volunteered now for the past 19 years as a school governor and I've been chair for the past five years. I started doing this by accident really. I went along to a PTA meeting at my eldest child's school when he was five just to see how I could help out and do my bit. The then chair of governors was there and just spoke to us about needing new parent governors and very briefly about what that meant. So I volunteered as it would fit around him and my youngest who was only one at the time. And here I am 19 years later and still doing it. I do have times where I think I should stop but something inside me keeps telling me to carry on, which I take to be the Holy Spirit. Both of my children really struggled at school educationally wise, academically, um, with their learning and they're both actually on the autistic spectrum as well. So they've got their own challenges, you know. The school that, I, that I'm a governor at is Cherry Tree, which is right opposite the church. A lot of those kids come into school, they come from dysfunctional homes, dysfunctional backgrounds, um, from places where there is judgment, there is condemnation, there is consequences to actions, but there is also just a do what you like attitude in some places. And I just really feel that if I can do my bit by helping the school, by overseeing the governance, then that's what I need to do. I'm so passionate about doing my bit and about all these children getting a good quality standard of education. And now also because our school's become part of a multi academy trust, I'm now, I'm now a director on the trust board as well. So that means I now influence policies and decisions and practices and stuff that goes on across five schools in Matherton and one in South Woodham. So for me, I now feel like I'm doing my bit, I'm doing my social justice bit and I'm doing it even outside of my own area just by following what God says to me. The area I spoke about is actually statistically in the bottom 10% in the county. So the area that our church is based in has some of the most marginalised people in the county of Essex. Not everywhere, but there are big pockets of deprivation. This looks look at things like educational achievement, percentage of working households, percentage of single parent families, domestic violence, drug and alcohol abuse, and a number of other factors. So what I'm trying to say to you is there's a real need right on your doorstep, church. There's a real need for social justice. There's a real need to show these children and to show these families God's love, to show them a place where there's love, there's acceptance, there's not judgment, there's not criticism, there's not bad mouthing their choices, there's not gossiping about your neighbours. There's a place where you can be loved and accepted for who you are. Now I'm not saying we've all got to do this, I'm not asking you all to volunteer a big chunk of your time or to dedicate 19 years of your life to something, but there are so many other ways we can get involved. One of the keys to all this though is that we need to have God's heartbeat for the marginalised. That's one of my biggest drivers for doing it. Like I said, I am passionate about kids having a good education, I am passionate about kids getting emotional behavioural support they need, I'm passionate about kids and families getting the mental health help and support they need so listen listen to God tune in to God and ask him what you can do how you can bring that into your own life how you can just reach out to somebody it might be on a one-to-one -one basis it might be something that I'm doing it might be something completely different but I'm telling you now there is definitely something out there for everyone to do so that we can activate this in our own lives Isaiah 58 is a key chapter in all this. It talks about God's people thinking they were being religious when in fact they were behaving badly and failing to be there for the poor, the hungry, the homeless, and the marginalised when in fact they've been chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the 
oppressed free and break every yoke. Like I said earlier, God doesn't choose the obvious. God chooses the marginalised. God chooses the not so obvious candidates. The beginning sees God saying to them, you fast but exploit your workers and it ends up in you fighting. Whereas they're thinking, look God, we're fasting and humbling ourselves to you and you don't even notice. They were completely missing the point. God didn't want them to just fast for one day. In verses 6 and 7 we read, Is not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loosen the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter, when you see the naked to clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? The point of this is that we need to show God's love practically to those around us. That is how we get to share God with them. We need to be help me helping to meet people's practical and spiritual needs, and that's what makes the church whole. Jesus gave us a very good and quite stark reminder of why we need to activate social justice in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, which is entitled in most Bibles, The Sheep and the Goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from one, one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And this is the key in verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to eat? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when we did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or needing clothes, or sick in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now I know what side I want to be on. And that seems quite harsh in a way, the way it's written, but the fact is, Jesus wanted them to open their eyes. He wanted them to see that by ignoring the needs of the people around them, they're ignoring Jesus. Jesus was passionate and cared about the people. You know, before he sat down to teach um, the parable of the, the loaves and the fishes, you know, he could say they were hungry. If people are hungry, they're not going to listen to you. If people are homeless, they're going to want somewhere to live. If people are thirsty, they want to drink. Meet their needs, see what you can do for those around you, see what you can, you can do for, to make a difference in your neighbours and your community's life. Think about the fact that it's not about them, it's about Jesus, it's about having that passion and compassion the same as he would for the people around him. We know that we're living in a very different world at the moment. And there is a lot of things going on in the name of social justice that we may not all necessarily agree with. Like I talked earlier about the marches, you know. Agree with it or not agree with it, that's a matter of opinion. But the fact is that people are mobilising and are doing something about it and they're wanting to make a change. However, one of the most positive things to have come out of the COVID-19 pandemic is that more people have come forward to volunteer than ever before. In Essex, for example, there was a lot more people than they needed which I think is great. In Basildon, a lady started a Facebook support group and lots of people responded on there, not only to help their neighbours, but complete strangers. Did you do your bit? Did you make sure your neighbours were okay? Did you make sure your friends were okay, your family, your colleagues, those around you? Sometimes the world 
not always, but sometimes the world and the way people are in the world can teach us a lesson. It can show us as Christians how we, what we need to do, how we should be being engaged with things. I'm not saying that's true for all things and all occasions. Obviously, our reference point is always the Bible. Our reference point is always God. Our reference point is always what would Jesus do. But that, for me, the fact that this lady just started this group and people offered and they responded, you know. We need to pray, church. We need to pray for this to continue. It's definitely an improvement and a way forward. As a church and Christians, we need to think about what we can do to support this and other initiatives. For instance, these are just a few I know. Project 587, which is the homeless feeding that's run through in Basildon, the homeless shelter, street pastors, school pastors, schools team ministry, and CAP, Christians Against Poverty. Now they're all church related things, they're all things that have come out of churches together. But they, I, I actually work in the voluntary sector as well, I work for an organisation called Homestar Essex. Um, we work across Essex supporting families by doing various programmes. Now, we always recruiting volunteers and local volunteers. There are so many ways you can get involved. So, you know, it's not one, one size fits all. It's a find something that you're passionate about. Find something that makes a difference. Find something that has got the time commitment level that you can respond to. Some stuff you can do at home. Some stuff you have to go out for. Some stuff it's just maybe giving into a different cause over and above what you give to church, you know. Just find something that... God speaks to you about. There's so many opportunities out there. Pray, talk to God, ask him, Lord, what is it you want me to get involved with it? With how can I connect? How can I activate social justice in my life? One final thing, as a church, we've always strived to be welcoming, warm and friendly. It's often been commented on how people feel and how they like the way they feel when they come into our building. And of course, yes, it's the Holy Spirit, but it's us as well. So what I want to do is challenge you all. When we can go back to meeting in our building, look for opportunities to connect with new people. Say hello. Offer them somewhere to sit. Come sit with you. Don't get upset if someone sits in your chair. It's not your chair. It's just a chair. It might be where you always sit on a Sunday. But do you know what? Put yourself out. I would love that our new bigger meeting space becomes too small. There are so many people that need God in Basildon that all our churches, if you put all of them together in Basildon, they should all be too small because there wouldn't be enough church space in Basildon to fit all of Basildon in. There are so many people out there that need God in their lives and it's our job to show them. It's our job to represent God in how we live and Jesus in how we care and we show compassion and kindness and be empathetic with people. So as a close, I want to remind you of what I said earlier. Are we more in love with the idea of changing the world than actually changing it? Are we going to just sit there and say, okay, well, I'll pray about that. And that's fantastic. You know, prayer is key to everything. But prayer requires action as well, sometimes from us. Sometimes it requires us to step up, step out and do something. What can you do? How can you get involved? What's your passion? How can you activate social justice in your life? Sit back, take time, reflect on what I've said and ask God. I'm just going to close in prayer. Father God, we just thank you. We just thank you, Lord, that you put us in a time and you put us in a place where we can serve you. Serve you in more ways than we ever know. Serve you in new ways that we've never even thought of. Father God, I just pray that you'll soften our hearts, that you'll give us a heart for those marginalised people around us, Lord. Those groups of people, those individuals, whatever it is, Lord, I just pray, Father, that you can just open our eyes. Open our eyes and let us see people the way you see people. Let us see the people that need your love, people that need lifting up, people need that, that need that helping hand, people that just need someone to talk to, someone to listen to them. Ultimately, we know, God, everyone needs you. But we just pray, Lord, that you give us new opportunities, that you give us new reasons and new ways to connect with these people, Lord. You give us fresh eyes to see those around us in a different way, Lord. See them the way that you would see them. See them if they need clothing, if they need feeding, if they need 
a drink lord, if they need shelter, if they need looking after. Father God, just open our eyes for you. Open our hearts for you, Lord. Open our hearts for your people. Father God, we just praise you and we just thank you, Lord, that you choose to use us. You choose to use your people to carry out your task, Lord. You choose to look beyond our flaws. You choose to look beyond our own insights and our own reasoning and give us your Holy Spirit, Lord, to guide us and to show us the way. And we just ask, Father God, that you'll just be with us all this week, Lord, and help us to continue to know how to connect and reach out to those around us. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Amen. This is the purpose of my life.